Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. I'll be talking about quick tips for basic bird identification. So this is me, Candace Havely. I'm a member of the Prairie Rapids Audubon Society. Our chapter serves six different counties here in the Cedar Valley, including Blackhawk, Bremer, Buchanan, Butler, Grundy, and Hardin County. And we have lots of different opportunities for you to join us on field trips, and come to our programs to listen to interesting speakers. And we hope that you will um, join us, whether it's on a virtual program or when we start holding our meetings um, face to face. But again, um, this is me. I've been birding since 2003 in earnest, but I have to tell you that I learned something every day. I learn something new about birds and about nature and the world every time I go out. And that's part of the fun of it. So this is my spark bird. Every birder can tell you what their spark bird is. And a spark bird is the bird that captured your attention that really got you hooked on bird watching. And who can blame me for being enamored with this gorgeous scarlet tanager with the jet black wings and that red, red um, body? Simply beautiful. You'll discover a spark bird too, and perhaps you already have, and that's why you're here joining me today. But let's talk about getting ready to bird. First and foremost, just bring your curiosity and you know, having that sense of wonder and discovery is what makes it fun when you um, start out in this, you know, new hobby or new uh, uh, endeavor to learn something new. And it's always just important to get outside in nature. It's actually healthy for us to spend time in nature. And research has proven that, that there are physiological changes in our body when we are out hiking, biking, kayaking, and walking, and just being immersed in nature. So you are doing a body good just by going outside. One thing as you start learning more about birds, I posit that you actually know more than you think you know. And again, just enjoy the process of learning something new and discovering um, the great beauty that birds offer to our world. So first of all, of course, when you go birding, you're going to need a field guide of some sort. Um, there are some apps for your iPhones or your smartphones, but I find just a, a print field guide is the ticket. Um, and your Independence Public Library has a great many variety of field guides. I was very impressed. There are some field guides that have drawings, such as this one that is illustrated. And it points out the particular field marks for the birds. It's very helpful as you learn. There are some field guides that have photographs. It can be help, helpful as well, because obviously, when you're looking through a binocular, you're going to see a bird more as it appears in a photograph than in a drawing. So you just find the field guide that speaks to you. And I find that a combination of a couple sources um, really can help as you learn. You'll need a set of binoculars. And at this point, if you're just beginning, I would just use the set that you probably have at home. Most people have some sort of binoculars um, that they've used maybe at sporting events or for hunting. And it really does help because you need to be able to look closely at the bird um, to notice the field marks um, in order for you to identify them. But don't go run out and buy an expensive set of binoculars first. If you get hooked on birding, then it does pay to invest in some good optics. And this particular brand, which is Vortex, and the Diamondback model is a really high quality pair of binoculars that is really pretty affordable. Our Audubon chapter does um, have a number of these that we take to our field trips. And this is the model that we've chosen just because of the quality and the cost point. 
So let's talk a little bit about some birding ethics and tips while we're out, whether we're out birding by ourselves or if we're with a group. First, just respect the birds. As much as possible, try not to disturb them or flush them, in particular like for a hawk or an owl that might be roosting. Sometimes that's not always possible because they will fly when you walk by or you drive by. But again, as much as possible, don't disturb them. It um, causes the birds to expend energy that they really need to keep um, so they can be healthy. It goes without saying that you should respect private property, stay on trails in the parks, and just be good custodians. When we're out with groups, of course, there's going to be a little bit of chit chat, um, but you know, don't talk loud, be respectful. When you're with a group and somebody's found a bird, help others find that bird so they can see it too. And when we're doing that, we'll often use like a clock method. So we'll say the bird is located at three o'clock in the oak in front of us. That way people know where to point their binoculars and, um, and get sight of the bird as well. And if you're with a group, if you see a bird, say something. It just could be the bird of the day. What's fun with a group is that you've got many pairs of eyes. And so if you notice some flutter of wings or some rustling in some you know, shrubs, um, again, point it out because those are signs that there is you know, birds yet to be discovered. I'd also caution you to, to just be kind to yourself as you're learning bird ID. It can be tricky. Like I said, there are some birds that I still even after all of these years, have a little bit trouble of IDing, those being shorebirds for one, but you do more, know more than you, than you think you do. And again, just be kind, you are learning. There's not gonna be a test and just the process of learning how to observe and what to observe is something that will become second nature to you as you continue to hone your bird watching skills. So let's talk about some of the field marks that um, help us identify birds. Um, so this is an illustration that you'll find in a lot of different field guides. The bird itself is a white-throated sparrow, and you'll notice that um, there are aspects of this bird's physiology that are pointed out. Um, you know, obviously you notice what the overall color of the bird is. That is a primary field mark. Um, but also, pay attention, you know, is the crown, what color is the crown? Does it have a stripe? Does it have an eye stripe? Does it have an eye line where the line is in the same plane as the eye? The lore is the area right in front of the eye that is referenced in a lot of different birds. So for this white-throated sparrow, they have yellow on their lures. Look at the beak or the bill or the mandibles as it's described here? What does the shape look like? Is it pointy? Is it thick? Is it very fine? Is it a duck's bill? That will help you clue into the family of birds that um, the species belongs to. Look at the throat or the back. Look for striping. Look for clear breasts look for wing bars. Sometimes you can even tell the color of a leg. Certain bird species will have um, a specific leg color and that will help you ID. So again, take in all of the information that the bird in your binoculars is giving you. And again, observe the bird as long as you can. You can look at your field guide or look at your online app when the bird flies away. Um, but just take a moment and just look at the bird and notice as many field marks as you can. Like I said, shape of the bill. Is there an eye ring? Is there a wing bar? What color is the wing bar? Notice the habitat. Is the bird perched in a tree? Is it on the side of a tree? Is it foraging on the ground? Is it perched on a power pole? And then watch for behavior. Is the bird 
scratch it around in the leaf litter? Is the bird actively, you know, bobbing for vegetation in the water? Um, you know, is it feeding young? Is it preening? Look at the behavior. And then also listen for calls or vocalizations. Now, mind you, only the male birds have a bird song per se, but birds vocalize to indicate their whereabouts in relation to um, others in their flock. They will make an alarm call. They will do a little um, what is called a chip note. Um, sometimes that indicates they've found food. So there's all sorts of bird vocalizations that will blow your mind when you start learning them. And it's really fun and interesting. And like I said, you already have an idea of what birds might be because you just need to trust your impression. I really like to use um, these silhouettes to illustrate what I'm trying to, to communicate. You know, we all kind of know the shape of a robin, which is a thrush, okay? We all know the silhouette of an owl typically. So when we see birds that kind of have that shape or that posture, you've got an impression of what family that bird might belong to. Like the nuthatches or the woodpeckers, they are often situated on the side of a tree rather than on top of a branch. So when you have that impression, you know which section of the field guide that you can turn to to start your ID um, process. So again, just this will become second nature and you'll just get a feel for, you know, is it a crow-like bird? Is it a bird that looks like a pheasant or a game bird? Is it a hawk that is soaring, etc.? Now, some of these backyard birds, um, will be familiar to you. So um, everybody can ID a blue jay. You probably see blue jays on a daily basis and they are beautiful birds. You probably hear blue jays on a daily basis because they're very vocal. Um, you all know what a rock pigeon or sometimes it's called a rock dove looks like. That is your typical pigeon. Um, some of you probably know the little bird on your left, the black cap chickadee. Now you'll find that some birds are aptly named. Obviously a field mark with this particular bird is its black cap. It also has a black throat. It has a very small beak. And these little birds have a vocalization that basically says their name. So they'll call out and say, chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. And once you learn that, you'll start hearing it in the forest, okay? I think all of this can probably identify the northern cardinal, um, but did you know that the females will stay brown throughout the year? And of course, the bright red birds are the male cardinals. A couple other field marks for these, for the male in particular, they've got the black mask and a you know really red or orangish beak. And the females indeed have got some reddish, um, colors on their wings and on their tail, and their beak is diagnostic as well. No other bird really has that color of beak. Um, and also the crest is a field mark for the Northern Cardinal. So this little bird, um, again, is oriented on the side of a tree. Um, so my impression is, I think this might be a nuthatch. It doesn't look like a woodpecker couple other field marks we look at is the black cap on the top of the head, the bill that is slightly upturned, pretty stout. Look at the white breast, and that's a hint to the name of this bird. It is indeed a white-breasted nuthatch. These birds will um, fly onto a tree, and then they will spiral down the tree and move down the tree hunting for grubs and bugs um, in underneath the bark. This is opposed um, to the red-breasted nuthatch. So look at the field marks for this bird. Um, this bird is smaller than the white-breasted nuthatch. It has its namesake, the red breast on this bird, but it has a really definite 
black eye line with a white eye stripe. Okay, it's got a similar bill to the white breasted nuthatch. And when you see them side by side, you can really notice the field marks that differentiate this bird. I might say that the red breasted nuthatch looks to be a female in this picture because the red on its breast is pretty muted. Um, if this bird was a male, it would be a little bit darker. So a white breasted nuthatch on your left, a red breasted nuthatch on your right. Um, also looking at habitat, the red breasted nuthatches sometimes really prefer conifers. So if you see this bird foraging, it tends to be in conifers. It also um, only shows up a lot of times in the winter here where the white-breasted nuthatch is a year-round resident. Okay, this little bird, again, is oriented on the side of the tree. So it's kind of like a nuthatch. It will travel and spiral up a tree, just working its way around, using its D-curved bill to, again, forage for grubs and insects in under the bark. Um, this is called a brown creeper. And you could remember that because it might, you know, it creeps up the tree as it forages. Um, its bird call is really, really very high pitched. And um, once you kind of learn it, you will hear it in the forest as well. Super cute little birds and um, birds that you will see if you've got um, particular, in particular, like wooded areas on your property. So I think everybody pretty much knows our Iowa State bird, the American goldfinch. This is a, an adult male in breeding or summer plumage. Again, you've got a black cap as a field mark. The bill is pretty stout. That is a finch-like beak. And then you'll see some white wing bars on the black um, wing. A lot of people really love these birds and they are really um, popular at our feeders in, this, in the um, summer and, and fall. And then people say, but my goldfinch leave during the winter. Well, some of them do, but some of them are year round residents. They just look like this. The winter plumage for the male goldfinch looks like this, very muted yellow, but you still have the white wing bar um, and they lose their black cap, and they actually look more like a female goldfinch. This is what a female goldfinch, the bird on the right, looks like pretty much year round. Again, you can see the field marks, the white wing bar on the black wing, a little bit of yellow, and that bill is diagnostic. Now, what about the bird on the left? It looks kind of like a female goldfinch, but it's stripy. Um, it's got some yellow. It's got the finch-like beak. Well, this is very similar to the goldfinch. Um, if you hear a bird that's calling and it says something like zit, 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 that tells you that you might have a pine siskin at your feeders. And again, this is what the adult pine siskins look like with males and females look similar. And again, um, its field marks are this overall brown stripy with the little bit of yellow and um, that, that call is diagnostic as well. Some more winter finches, and I'm kind of showing you some of the birds that you were likely to have at your feeders at this time of year. So that's why we're kind of finch heavy, if you're wondering. Um, these two birds are males. Um, the, the purple finch on your left um, looks like it's been dipped in raspberry juice. Um, it's got that finch beak again, and it's a little bit streaky as well. But this, the streaks on their belly and their breast are a little bit more muted. When you look at the male house finch on your right, the coloration's a little bit more orangey red rather than raspberry red. That's a diagnostic field mark to differentiate these two birds. And look at the, the really definite dark stripe on the belly of this male house finch. A lot of times um, 
we're perplexed by little brown birds and actually birders will say, ah, oh, that's just a little brown bird. Um, they do confound us. A lot of the little brown birds tend to be the females or the really young juveniles. Um, but these are adult females of the purple finch and the house finch. And actually, I find it easier to ID the female purple finch simply because the white eye stripe is really definite. And then she's got some really definite streaking here, but that white eye stripe is diagnostic. Notice that the um, female house finch does not have that definite white eye stripe. So you're probably gonna have a combination of male and female finches at your feeders, in particular during the winter. Now, woodpeckers, they are very popular. They are year round, they do not migrate. Uh, they're pretty gregarious. They readily come to feeders, they readily come to suet. And here are two of the common ones that you might have. Um, and notice the difference between these two birds. The hairy woodpecker on the left has got a very long beak and as opposed to the very shorter um, beak on the downy woodpecker. The downy woodpecker is about four inches um, long, where the hairy woodpecker is probably twice the size. But when you've got a single bird, you can't always judge the size per se. Um, notice that the little red um, marking on the back of these birds' heads, that indicates that these birds are male. If they were females, they would not have the red markings. Notice that little downy actually has some polka dots on its wing bars, um, and um, that can help you differentiate too. But principally, it is the size of the beak that makes the difference in terms of IDing these two woodpeckers. Another woodpecker that readily comes to your feeders um, is this one. And um, if you'll notice the field marks on this bird, um, it's got uh, some striping, black and white striping. Um, some people characterize this as like the zebra woodpecker, which is a good way to remember it if you want to. Um, it has red on its head. Um, so you might think that this is a red headed woodpecker. Well, it, actually is a red-bellied woodpecker. And you might be wondering why it is indeed called that. But when you see a male in breeding plumage in the spring, you definitely see the red belly of this particular bird. Now, this is a male because the coloration um, extends um, on the, the bird from the base of the beak clear to the nape of the neck. So this would indicate that it is a male red-bellied woodpecker. A red-headed woodpecker is the bird on your right, and you'll notice the difference. Um, again, the red-headed woodpecker is a different color of red. It's got a full hood of this crimson red, which is just gorgeous. Um, this is my favorite woodpecker in Iowa. The jet black wings and the large um, white um, tips of the wings are diagnostic. Um, so again, red-headed woodpecker on the right, as opposed to the red-bellied woodpecker on the left. Now there's another woodpecker that might readily um, be found in your backyard and oftentimes is found on the ground because they often forage for ants. Um, they um, are speckled as their breasts. They've got a dark black collar. Um, this particular woodpecker also has what's called a mallard stripe. That's that field mark. Um, the um, males have got the mallard stripe. Notice the back of this bird also has a little bit of a heart-shaped red patch, which is really sweet. And there's a little bit of white, a white rump patch that is really apparent when the birds are in flight. This is called a northern flicker. And you'll notice that there is yellow colorations in the tail and the wing feathers. And this is why this bird is called a yellow shafted northern flicker. The yellow shafted flickers principally are Eastern species. And if you go West in the United States, say like Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, 
California, you will find red shafted woodpeckers. In Nebraska, sometimes you will find a hybridized flicker where really it's a little bit orange because they have um, hybridized. So that's always interesting. Um, the northern flickers will gather up in the fall um, for a bit of a migration. Um, they will, um, will just move from place to place. They don't necessarily go to South America per se for migration, but they will migrate um, out of the local vicinity to, at times. And again, um, when you see a really bright white rump patch as these birds are flying away from you, that is a good hint that you're looking at a northern flicker. All right, probably the most impressive woodpecker that Iowa has is indeed the pileated woodpecker. And you'll notice that for this species, um, the female has a malar stripe, but it's black. A male pileated woodpecker will have a red malar stripe. Notice the coloration on this bird's crest also ends at the forehead and does not extend clear down to the base of the beak. This tells you that this is a female pileated woodpecker. These birds are impressive. They're the size of a crow. They will, you know, um, take the bark off trees. So if you see patches of um, trees that have bark missing or long oval holes that have been ex excavated, that tells you that you are in the vicinity where a pileated woodpecker has been foraging. Really pretty impressive. And when you're out in the forest, sometimes you discover and you see something really extraordinary, like this next bird. This is a leucistic pileated woodpecker. And all leucistic means is that it's lacking pigment. So as you see, the feathers that would normally be black on this bird are this gorgeous silver color. And again, as I mentioned, this is a male bird because you see the malar stripe is red and the coloration goes from the crest clear to the edge or the base of the bill. And that tells you that this is a beautiful pileated, uh, male pileated woodpecker. Um, these birds are really vocal um, as well, in particular when they fly. And um, so, um, and again, a lot of people notice that this is the, kind of shape of a woodpecker that the cartoon character Woody Woodpecker is based on. And so it has that little bit of that vocalization like the Woody Woodpecker laugh. All right. Another beautiful bird that you'll see um, in the, you know, starting the end of February and March in larger flocks is this gorgeous cedar waxwing. So let's talk about the field marks for this bird. Um, it has a crest. And it has what I call a Zorro mask, really definite, gorgeous birds. The feathers really look very, very sleek, like they don't have a feather out of place. And then where they get their name is some of their tail feathers and often their wing feathers will look as though it's dipped in red and yellow wax, hence the name waxwing. These birds tend to to fly in flocks. You don't generally see like one cedar waxwing by itself. Um, you will see many cedar waxwings and they all move as a flock as well. And they've got really, really high pitched calls. All right, our next group of birds are um, the doves. And again, they look similar to a pigeon. They're in that particular family. A lot of you might be familiar with the morning dove. They've got that beautiful, um, morning call like ooh, 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 ooh. I remember growing up with that call when I lived in um, back in Wyoming um, in the country and um, it's one of my favorite bird calls actually um, so this is um, your morning dove um, pretty uniformly brownish gray um, usually there's a blue eye ring that's quite beautiful. It looks like it's got blue eyeshadow on. Um, the other dove that you will um, encounter in Iowa, and, um, and these can be seen kind of year round. 
Um, sometimes the morning doves are not um, as apparent in the winter per se, but um, the Eurasian collar dove are. And um, again, this is an introduced species, hence the name Eurasian. And um, their basic field mark is this really dark black collar on the back of their neck. This is a larger dove than your morning dove. And they've got a square tail. So when they are perched, um, you will see that squared off tail. Beautiful birds. And their call is not beautiful and mournful. It's actually, uh, they could make a, a bit of racket. Um, so, um, but, but they're really cool birds. All right. People find sparrows hard to ID and sometimes they are a bit of a challenge. Um, and these are a couple um, sparrows in particular. The bird on the right, you see a lot. This is your common house sparrow. And it is also a European species. Um, they have got the black chin that extends down to the um, to the chest. They've got a gray cap, and then you know some black markings on their wing. Clear breast, clear belly. This is your basic house sparrow. But I really wanted you to start looking closely at, at the sparrows in your yard because you might have a Eurasian tree sparrow. So this bird has got a brown cap. It also has a little a black throat, but notice one of the definitive field marks is this black polka dot on the white cheek. If you see a little bird that's got a black polka dot on its cheek and it's got a, a brown cap, you have got a Eurasian tree sparrow. And those are um, regarded as being rare in our state. There are more um, of these birds that are um, they're gaining in population and there are reliable sightings of the Eurasian tree sparrow even here in Buchanan County. Um, there's always been small populations in southern Iowa uh, like in the Keokuk area and then there's a group of them that were staying down by the Terry True Blood Reservoir in Iowa City um, and I went and looked for those birds in Iowa City before and came up empty-handed. My life um, bird my life Eurasian tree sparrow, I actually found in Bali of all places. And now it is so cool that I can come back here to Iowa and see the same bird that I saw in, um, in Indonesia. So that's pretty cool. So I mentioned the term life bird. This is just something that us birders say. When we've seen and identified a bird for the very first time, we call it a lifer. So, um, that's one thing that makes birding really fun, especially when you're beginning, because all of your birds are live birds. And believe me, I still get excited when I get um, live birds on my list. Okay, so again, start looking through the sparrows in your yard, see if you've got any Eurasian tree sparrows. Here's another little sparrow um, that we see typically in the, the um, winter. These are your true snowbirds. They come to us in the winter and these are called dark-eyed juncos. And in Iowa, we tend to get the slate colored one, which is the bird on the left. Um, this is kind of the majority of the juncos that we see. Every once in a while, you see a, a sweet little pink sided junco. Those are my favorites. Again, aptly named because they've got a little pink wash to them. And if you're really lucky, you'll find an Oregon dark-eyed junco which is um, got that dark jet black hood with a brown tannish back and um, tan or rust um, breast color. And um, again, these will forage on the ground. They tend to flock together as well. A lot of sparrows do that. You'll see them moving through their habitat in groups rather than as individual birds. The juncos sound like little tiny bells as they move. It's really, really enchanting when you hear them and um, you start to um, identify their calls. Couple more sparrows. Um, and if you'll notice, um, notice the posture of the white crowned sparrow on the right. It's a little bit more upright. They are a, lot, a little bit bigger bird than the white-throated sparrow, so they will kind of um, stand up 
a little bit taller and elongated. Um, aptly named because they've got a white crown. That white stripe on an adult is diagnostic. The color of the beak as well and the black eye line tells you that you're looking at a white crown sparrow. Clear breast, okay. And again, we looked at the field marks on the illustration for the white threaded sparrow. So again, let's use some of our terminology. You've got the yellow lore. Of course, you've got the white throat. You've got the black eye line. And again, the yellow eye stripe. It has a little bit of a white stripe on its crown too, but it's not as thick and as definite as this white crown sparrow, okay? Both of these birds have a little bit of white on the wings. Um, again, notice how similar the, the bills are on these birds. But again, your basic field mark for the white-throated sparrow is the white throat and the yellow lure. All right, let's quit talking about little birds and let's start talking about some larger birds. Um, Right now, in particular, there's a lot of perching raptors, and a lot of you are familiar with the red-tailed hawk. Um, so these birds um, are ubiquitous, really. Um, they are on power lines, they are on signs along the road, um, they are in trees. Um, they will perch on your back fence at times. Um, obviously, they've got a red tail when they're adults. Another field mark that you can look at is um, if you see the bird from the back, like in this photo, look for this kind of white V-shaped. And that is um, one way that you can help determine that this is a red-tailed hawk. But a lot of times you see them in flight and the diagnostic field mark for IDing these birds in flight are these dark patagial patches, which is right here at the top edge of their wings, and that is diagnostic. Red tails generally have a brown cap or a little brown hood here, and very often you will also find that they've got this um, belly band. Um, there are some red tails that have a clear belly, but a very lot of them will have this speckling on their belly, and it's called a belly band. Now, some of you might be saying, um, Geez, Candace, I don't understand why you are telling me this is a red tail hawk. It has no red tail. Well, the bird in flight is a juvenile. That's why the tail still has the striping. They get their red tail, like the bird in the left, um, when they're about two years old. Okay. So as you're driving around, um, you might encounter a bird that looks like this on the left. And you might think initially, looks like a red-tailed hawk. But notice how very dark the belly band is and how really definite and, and thick that belly band is. And it's got a little bit more delicate features. The bill's a tiny bit smaller. Um, this bird is a rough-legged hawk. And it can be more easily identified as they fly. Um, so a lot of times the hawks will flush off their perch as you drive by and very carefully and safely while you're driving, see if you can notice these really dark, huge patches um, at the bird's wrist. That will tell you that you've got a light, more rough-legged hawk. These birds um, migrate down from the Arctic during the winter. And so this is the time that we are seeing them now. They are beautiful birds. Um, they are called rough-legged hawks because they actually have feathers that go clear to their feet just to keep them warm because they are in the Arctic, okay? So again, let's compare. The rough-legged hawk has got the large dark wrist patches as opposed to the red-tailed hawk that has the dark patagial marks, okay? So there's some smaller hawks that are called occipiters, and these are hawks that typically hunt through woodland areas. They're really quick flyers. They can maneuver between branches and such. And you see quite a few sharp-shinned hawks and Cooper's hawks in um, town. So some of you might be having um, 
observed a couple of these at your bird feeders because they do prey on songbirds, which can be a little traumatizing. But they're, they're super cool hawks. And these are some of the hardest hawks to ID, even for experienced birders, because they're so, so similar. A sharpshin shock is, hawk is a little bit smaller than the Cooper's hawk. But you look at the shape of the head. It's got a rounded head and a dark nape on the sharp shinned. And um, true to its name, it's got really thin little legs. And then when it's perched, it's got a squared off tail. Where your Cooper's hawk is going to have a round tail when it's perched. It's got a lighter nape, but look at the shape of its head. It's kind of flat, it's kind of angled. That can help you ID a Cooper's hawk. Now the occipiters, when they fly, they'll do a flap, flap, glide, flap, flap, glide. So if you notice that flight pattern, then you can say to yourself, I think that's either a sharp shinned or it's a Cooper's hawk. It's some sort of occipiter as opposed to a buteo or a hawk like a red tail hawk. Okay. Owls are always popular. Um, some of you may know that this is a barred owl named for the barring on its breast. Um, the barred owl is one of the only owls in the United States that has dark eyes. Um, there's only a few species that have dark eyes as opposed to yellow eyes. And it's got a round head. And you'll notice that the facial discs, again, help channel the sound to their ears. Um, these birds are beautiful birds. They really love being around water, so you'll see them a lot along the rivers and the streams and lakes. Um, these birds will often be calling kind of late afternoon, and they're the birds that do the hoo 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 call. So if you hear that when you're out in the woods, you're listening to a barred owl. Most of you might ID this as a hoot owl. And that's kind of a colloquial name for this, but this is indeed a great horned owl. Again, has that regular owl shape with the, with the ear tufts. Um, gorgeous yellow eyes, but another field mark is this white, white bib. And a lot of the plumage of great horned owls can vary. Sometimes they're really light, sometimes they're dark, um, like this bird. But again, if you see a, a large owl with um, ear tufts and this white bib, you're looking at great horned owl. And their call is a lot different than the barred owl. So they will call something like, hoo-hoo, 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 hoo-hoo. And it's kind of lower, so. Um, these birds are often called tigers of the sky. They are gregarious hunters. They will take whatever prey that they can catch. And one of their favorite food sources is, believe it or not, skunks. So fun fact. Now, sometimes you'll have the pleasure of seeing little small owls. And um, just, just know that just because you find a small owl, it's not a baby owl. They tend to be just a small species. So the eastern screech owl, is the bird on the left. Notice again, it's got the pointed ear tufts, but look at the striping of the plumage. They camouflage very, very well. When they are setting um, against um, the bark of a tree, they will very often um, nest in cavities. So you will see them kind of sitting in the opening of a, a tree cavity, sunning themselves. Um, and they sound um, really, really interesting. Google an Eastern screech owl call, and then um, you'll see what I mean. It's almost like a horse whinnying. It's pretty cool. The small owl on your right is the Northern Sawwet Owl. And these guys migrate to our area. They show up about November and they, they leave about March, but really cool little birds. They're about the size of like my iPhone. And they, um, the field marks for these guys, um, is this white kind of M over their face and the yellow eyes, um, really cool little birds. Just a few more slides. Um, I wanted to 
point out this particular little bird. This is a winter finch that comes down from the north. So these are birds usually found in Canada, in northern Minnesota, in Wisconsin. This is a common red pool. And why I'm pointing this out is we are having a bit of an eruption here for these birds right now. There's a lot of them being seen in Blackhawk County, Buchanan, all through the state of Iowa. So take a, again, a look at some of the birds that are with the goldfinch um, at your feeders. Notice the field marks. You've got a black chin, you've got a little finch beak that's yellowish, but this little red little mark on their forehead is diagnostic of a common red pole. Pretty cool little birds. And then finally, sometimes, like I said, you find something extraordinary, something that doesn't look like anything you've ever seen. And you might be thinking, these birds have got a, a, a beak deformity because they're crossed. Well, that's intentional. They are red crossbills because they use their beaks to pry open the pine cones to get to the seeds. Um, these are birds that are a little bit smaller than a robin, pretty gregarious. They like to, to fly in small flocks. They love conifers. And um, if you notice a lot of, of feeding and you know um, flurry of pine needles falling, um, like when you're walking through a neighborhood, or a lot of times you will see red cross bills in cemeteries just because there's usually a lot of conifers at cemeteries. Look up because you might come across a red cross bill, and these are seriously cool birds. I mean, just look at them with a crossed bill. Super cool. Um, if you see these birds or if you see a common red pole, let us know. We love to see these rare birds too. So, a really quick summary of some of the winter birds that you might be seeing at your uh, feeders or in your backyards or along the bike, uh, the trails that you're hiking or biking um, this winter. Um, you know, if you were wanting to kind of put your skills, your identification skills to the test, why don't you consider participating in the great backyard bird count. Um, it is being held the 18th through the 21st. Um, go to their website at birdcount.org for more details. And um, you just record your sightings and enter them in online. Um, our Audubon group is not having any organized field trip per se for the backyard bird count. We just go out and we count the birds that are in our backyard, or I count the birds that I see when I'm snowshoeing, um, et cetera. A few little hints. For this backyard bird count, you count all the individual birds you see or hear that you can ID. Try not to count the birds twice. So if you've got your feeder set up and, you know, I always look for how many birds do I see all together. So if I see five chickadees all together on my feeders, um, then I'll write down the number five. I don't count, you know, five and then, oh, here's three more, or I've seen this bird three more times, you kind of estimate kind of what is the um, highest number of each species that you see. Um, the backyard bird count wants to know like when you started your observations, you know, how many people are helping you um, do this, but this is a little bit of doing citizen science. Um, and it's part of the fun of um, doing birding is to contribute to these citizen science projects. Again, we've talked about how necessary field guides are to help build your skill set and to reference when you're IDing. There are some online guides and smartphone apps. Um, I recommend All About Birds and the Merlin app, which are um, produced by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. The Merlin app in particular is, is really cool because it will kind of guide you. It will ask you questions. You know, is the bird a robin sized? You know, where is it at? What colors are it? And then it, it uses GPS and it knows which area you're in and it will give you suggestions of the possible birds that you were seeing. This summer, the Merlin app also rolled out a vocalization app where you can record a bird call and it will identify it for you. Um, it matches the recording that you're sharing with a sound file database. And it is generally spot on. Every once in a while, it's a little bit wonky, but it is a great tool
to start learning bird vocalizations and it's super easy. So if you've got a smartphone, look for the Merlin app and it has um, Android and um, Apple um, or iPhone apps available. The Audubon Online Guide to North American Birds, of course, I should promote. Um, and there's also some paid apps like the Sibley app or the iBird Pro. Um, eBird um, is again, a tool of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It is the tool that we use when we're out birding to record the number of species um, that we see and the number of birds we see. And again, it is collecting our data and it connects to Merlin. So you can actually search the Merlin app when you're in eBird. Again, look for eBird on your app store and download it. So, and you also have to download like the state package for Iowa or the Midwest. So just a hint there. If you've got questions, go ahead and email me and I'd be glad to answer questions um, for you. But it's, um, it's really easy and fun to use. Um, again, like I said, some field guide suggestions. Um, kind of the gold standard is the Sibley Birds Eastern Edition. Um, other longstanding field guide um, people have a preference for the Peterson's Field Guide. Um, and then the field guides that use the photographs instead of drawings. And then there's a bird book called Birds of Iowa. And that is a book arranged by colors. So I can turn to the section of gray birds and it will show me the species for the state of Iowa that um, are there. So it's kind of a fun, easy way to, to begin. And um, it's how I started to learn Iowa birds actually. And I still have that book on my shelf. All right. Another way to learn bird identification is to just learn from others. Come and join us when we do our Wednesday morning birding. We'll start um, having those field trips, which we do socially distanced and following you know, health protocols. Um, but we offer these in the spring and the fall. Um, we meet about eight o'clock at various places within the Cedar Valley. So we try to come to spots in Buchanan County, Blackhawk County. Um, Sometimes we do farther um, field trips that are farther away, like to Sweet Marsh in Bremer County or um, um, Hardin County, um, Pintail Wetlands and such. Um, every once in a while we do a special field trip, like we go to the Mississippi River in November to see the migrating tundra swans. That's super cool. Um, join us for our Christmas bird counts. And um, we have a big uh, field trip in May, which is our birdathon. So um, that's a, a, a full day of birding. You can join us for as long as you want and it's a great fun. And again, you learn a ton of stuff when you bird with others. And as you might guess, a lot of us birders are really enthusiastic. We really love birds and we want others to love birds and we are more than happy to help you kind of learn as you go. There is a state ornithologist union in the state. Again, incredibly nice people. They have some fun field trips and they'll have a weekend of meetings um, in the spring and the fall. And then for those of you who have kids or grandkids, there is an Iowa Young Birders Group as well. And they have got um, terrific volunteers. Our chapter has partnered for um, field trips in the Cedar Valley with Iowa Young Birders. And it's just been a great organization. And our chapter also supports um, that organization in terms of helping to you know, offer um, financial funds for that so they can um, to provide those educational experiences for kids. So, so again, when you're out birding and if you're utilizing like eBird or you're contributing to the Christmas bird count or the backyard bird count, you are participating in citizen science. And this is important because it provides data and um, provides statistics for bird populations. The scientists can look for difference in migration patterns, notice a change in the bird's range. There are some birds in our state that again, have started to move north, just like the Eurasian tree sparrow I spoke of, where you could almost only find them in the Southern Iowa. Now we're seeing them in Buchanan County reliably. Um, we see them in Blackhawk County around the Gilbertville area, et cetera. Um, we used to never see summer tanagers or Carolina wrens much here. 
but now these birds are moving, their ranges are changing. And all of the citizen science data, the population data that we contribute, really we hope helps to inform better conservation decisions by our um, state DNR and by the US Fish and Wildlife um, when they um, look at you know, managing habitat or you know, um, offering opportunities for conservation of particular areas. So it's important work, but it's also fun work. So again, I just urge you to get out there and start practicing. Go birding and just enjoy being out of doors, enjoy learning all the new um, field marks and behaviors and see what you can find and see what you can explore. Again, it's a great lot of fun. Seriously, if you've got questions, you want to learn more, I would love to go birding with any of you. Just email us at prautobahn at gmail.com and uh, we'll set up a time to go birding. And um, again, I have learned so much from my birding colleagues. I would love to share my enthusiasm and my expertise. And let us know what you're seeing out there. Um, let us know what's at your feeders. Let us know if you've been so lucky to find a little screech owl you know, that is inhabiting one of the trees in your shelter belt. Um, or maybe you have found a crossbill or a red pole at your feeders too. Um, again, share your sightings with us and um, we really um, will appreciate that. And I appreciate you taking the time to join me for this presentation today. Happy birding.